Okay, so welcome everyone. So I've seen some familiar names sign up, which is great to see. Hello and welcome again. And also lots of new names. So welcome to the new people that haven't really uh, interacted with me. I know we're kind of online, so it's still not quite there, but it's one step closer, All right? Um, yeah, so just a quick overview. My name's Michael. I've been in the Chinese medicine field for about 15 years is actually when I started studying it. I went to China when I was 20 and I was an English teacher there for a while. And this was all before, you know, you needed qualifications and experience. <laughs> I just went over there. Um, with a group of teen, uh, with a group of Australians to do like a summer camp, and then I stayed there and I got a job, and all this stuff happened, which was amazing at the time. And then I came back from China about a year later, and I was a bit lost. But then I was, uh, but down the road was a school teaching Chinese medicine, Chinese massage, acupuncture stuff like that, and so I enrolled in that. Got myself a bicycle and some textbooks, and then that was my new life from that point on. Um, and, and it just kept, like Chinese medicine is kind of one of these things that just keeps giving. And I heard one amazing teacher explain it, that the, the sort of philosophy or the wisdom that comes out of Chinese medicine is not really a linear process. Like in the West, we tend to be, like we add on, we add knowledge. Once we get that, we move to the next one, right? But with Chinese medicine, it's more like a, a circle. So we kind of, we come into this sort of field of knowledge. We pick up something new and then we move to the next field of knowledge, which we've been familiar with a little bit and we learn something new. So we just keep kind of spinning around in this place, picking up new insights and stuff like that from its basic uh, principles. And so today we're going to be talking about a very, you know, very serious subject. And this is a subject I've been sort of tiptoeing around for years because it is complicated. It's serious. It's, and I was always sort of staying in the mild depression space because it's easier to explain. It's easier to treat actually as well. Mild depression is much easier to treat. Um, but more recently, a few months ago, watching some documentaries around bipolar, the seriousness, the seriousness of it all, and also the medications and the increase in diagnosis of these conditions is on the rise. And the treatment principles or the treatments available are not that, are not that good. I don't think they're very good. Generally, mood stabilizing medication. And cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of the, the highest standard. And that, that's great for some people, and it, and it does potentially work for a lot of people, and that's great, but it doesn't really get to why is these patterns coming online in the first place, right? If we're just mood stabilizing ourselves, why is the mood going out in the first place? Why is the chemistry going out in the first place? And this is what Western med really struggles with. And uh, so when I, I went back into the Chinese medicine literature, reflections, observations, and I'm like, oh, wow, this is a great explanation. This, this is, makes a lot of sense. So this is what I wanted to bring up today. And I've set myself quite a, a challenge to be able to uh, explain these patterns in an hour, hour and a half. But I think I've done a good job. So let's see, <laughs> you be the, <laughs> you be the, the cider. And so one of my goals from the today is really that you have a better understanding of where it's coming from. Like what's the patterns, what's the mechanics underneath that's leading us to these conditions? Because again, we can sort of put a medication or we can put nutrition on top to try and like, manage the symptoms or we can try to work at what's going on underneath 
Okay, so the way today is going to run and the way I've set it up is uh, the first part I'm going to talk about, like what is bipolar, what's the symptoms, how do we define it? And then I'll talk about the, the patterns in Chinese medicine, like the framework of Chinese medicine, how I've used the mind. And then once we get that, uh, we'll probably have a little break, actually, like a five minute, just breather, have a cup of, grab a cup of tea, because then after that, I'll talk about the treatment options. Now that we know the patterns, what can we do? So that's kind of the basic overview of what I hope to cover. And throughout it, I'll stop in various points. And I'll open it up to questions. So if you've got questions about a certain thing we just covered, and we can go into that in more detail. Yeah. So I better I'll get into it because we've got a lot to cover. And I'm going to share share my screen. And you can always like uh, send me a chat or something like that if there's something that you want to urgent, urgently say or, you know, there's a technology, you can't hear me or something like that. Just send me a chat message and I'll get it. So, yeah, today we're going to talk about TCM mainly and EFT for bipolar clinical depression and grounding. Grounding, I put it in there because it's like a different, you know, different term we use, but it's very strongly linked to things like depression and bipolar. And you'll, you'll see why in a moment. So you, again, health disclaimer, this is not intended to replace advice from your preferred health professional. I would say this information would be used in, con, in alignment or in congruence with what you're currently doing. So if you're working in Western medicine framework, that's fine. See if you can add some of these principles to what you're doing. I wouldn't say get rid of that and take on this. It's, it's too uh, sudden. And when you, anytime reducing medications, it's very uh, complicated to always speak to your doctor about any potential to reduce medications if you're already on them. So first we need to define bipolar, right? What is it? So it's defined as an extreme mood, uh, extreme moods from a height of mania, which they call the top, and then depression on the bottom. It can last, usually last days, months is normal, like the average. However, I know people that it goes in years four-year cycles, like four years, they're very extroverted, very uh, joyful, exuberant, amazing. And then four years, they disappear, and they're very depressed and very withdrawn. Now, this is one of the interesting things, and this is what sets bipolar out, is that the mania aspect, when a person is in mania, they actually feel good. They feel amazing. <laughs> And they won't, they don't think anything's wrong. And this is, it's very hard to treat because they won't take medications. They won't do anything because the mania is a good feeling, joyful, ecstatic even. So, uh, and also when you meet a person who's in a mania state, they're often the, the funnest person in the room, right? Extremely extroverted, quite fun. Um, you know, so many things about them. And it's easy to understand why that they, they're enjoying it. You know, they like the mania in a lot of ways. <clears throat> so what the problem is, is when they don't sleep for days and days and days, they don't sleep. And then it starts getting a little bit 
weirder, you know, a little bit more psychosis kind of comes in. What I want to also give the idea is that mania is like a spectrum. So mania is kind of at the top, but between like being stable and between, so yeah, between being stable and being mania is this space, which I would call eccentric or a little bit quirky. And eccentric and being quirky is good, I would say. It's a good thing. It's very creative. So a lot of very creative people are actually in that space. It's just, it's a mild form of mania, if you wanted to look at it like that. But it's not that harmful. And I've even heard people say, like uh, psychiatrists and stuff that I've been reading, is that the same creative power, the same creative energy that makes you a creative person is the same energy that can drive you mad. If you can't like manage it properly. So there's a tendency that very creative people, musicians, et cetera, they have a more general tendency towards getting things like bipolar because they're already creative and it's very easy for them to trigger up into mania, like drug use, you know, partying all the time or, or whatever the lifestyle. It's very easy to trigger yourself up into mania if you're a creative person. So mania is dis, kind of dysfunctional, but being eccentric is good. Again, it's okay to be eccentric. And then, of course, once we got the eccentric period, then we go into depression. So it's kind of like you've burned well, a lot of energy, and now you go into the other state. So what makes bipolar unique compared to other uh, psychiatric uh, disease or, or imbalances is the mania aspect. The mania aspect is what's unique. And in that, that's what we're basically focusing on mainly in treating and understanding. If you can understand the mania, the depression doesn't seem to be, you know, the fallback in depression doesn't seem to be there or as strong if you can uh, manage the mania better. So people in mania, they talk fast sometimes, they don't sleep for days, lots of energy, feel good. They spend money, it's often a thing, you know, they get on a, they get on a, um, a particular, like go down a, a wormhole and they just start spending money. They have lots of great ideas, you know, they kind of think they're onto something, they're starting businesses. Uh, they tend to be hypersexual, so extremely sexually active, just because they've got so much energy, and that causes problems. It can destroy relationships and stuff because that energy you know, might destroy a marriage and stuff like that. In the old Chinese books, which is quite interesting, in the old Chinese books, they, they don't have an exact translation for mania. It's slightly different, and it's not quite on the, on the mark. Because bipolar is a modern disease, actually. There's no direct translation in the old Chinese books. Bipolar is a modern disease. So the, mo the closest thing to mania in the old Chinese books, they added the person enjoys or the person has an inspiration to climb hills, to climb to the top of a mountain, singing and taking their clothes off. So that's how they would describe it in the, in the old days. And you might see some of these symptoms as well, right? Person singing with joy, taking the clothes off, you know, they're so ecstatic. Climbing mountains is a pretty interesting one or climbing to high points. So that's also something to be aware of. So to get into the Chinese, uh, psychology they what i wanted to bring up that there's different types of mind different functionings of mind let's call it and this is not an unfamiliar idea to us in the west right so we had freud who came along and he gave us these terms the unconscious 
the conscious mind, pre-conscious mind. Later on, he brought the ego, the id, stuff like this. So if you look at it, he is describing different parts of the mind. And, and then Carl Jung went off and developed it a bit further. He created the ego or a different version of the ego, collective consciousness. So new terms of describing the mind. And these days, everyone uses this now. We use subconscious mind. Everyone talks about subconscious mind, right? Even great scientists are talking about subconscious mind. This is still a relatively new idea to Westerners, you know, 30, 40 years, this idea of having different parts of the mind. But in the old sort of even the Buddhist traditions, the yogic traditions and the Chinese medicine traditions, they had already fleshed out these ideas. They had fleshed out different parts of the mind, different functions. I think in Buddhism, there's a hundred different parts of the mind. That's a lot of mind, right? Different functions. <laughs> so as Westerners, we're still learning and still fleshing out this idea that there's different parts of the mind involved. And so when we go to Chinese med, they fleshed out five primary parts of the mind. The Shen, so I'll go through it briefly and then you know, we'll have questions. And we'll be talking a lot more about this because this is really the foundation of it. So we've got five parts of the mind. The Shen part of the mind, which is probably the most famous in Chinese med. The Shen is basically your conscious mind. And it was translated across as being spirit. But I think a more accurate translation is mind. When we use the word spirit, it kind of gets a bit lost, right? But when we use the word mind, it's much more tangible, much more easier to identify. So the Shen is your conscious mind, and it's really in charge of managing your thoughts. And it comes out of the eyes when you're awake. And it interacts with the world, like connecting with other people. That's part of the Shen's job, is how does this, the spirit mind, right, there's the word, how does your mind interact with the world in a healthy way? So that's the Shen's job. The next one over here, the green one, is the Hun. Now, the Hun is, is in charge of creativity, inspiration, planning, and it's, so it's actually the closest thing to what we call in the West as a soul, actually. So the Hun is a very creative part of the mind. And it's very inspired. It's also in charge of our dreams, dreams when we're asleep, and also our life dreams, right? what we want to do with our lives. If you are drawn to this or drawn to Chinese medicine, if you are inspired by this idea of Chinese medicine or whatever you're into, the inspiration is the hun that's moving you here, moving you there. And in Chinese medicine, they say that the hun is the part of your mind which continues after you die. So there's parts of your mind that actually die with the body. And then there's parts of your mind that continue. And I like this because it kind of solves that great argument. What happens when we die? Do we just finish or do we continue? And in this model, we do both. Right, we do both. We continue and we die and we stop. That's a very Asian, Eastern Oriental philosoph philosophical approach is it's not usually this or that, which is a very Western kind of way of thinking of things. It's this and that. Right? Yin. So in, in the West, we say yin and yang, but actually it's pronounced yin yang. 
it's not separated. In the West, we say mind and body. But in the East, we would say mind, body. The same thing. So we'll come back to this because the Shen and the Hun is actually the most important part of when we talk about bipolar. So this is what we're going to focus on. The other aspects of the mind, just quickly, the G, which is the blue one down here. And this is more about your willpower, your determination, your focus, your drive. Following through on ideas. And it's also in charge of long-term memory storage. The next one, the Po over here, the gray one. This is actually the part of the mind that governs your physicality the most. It's more like your physical mind, if that's such a thing. So this governs the strength of your body, your immune system, your balance, your movement of your body, your coordination, your breathing. And the Po is actually the part of the body or the part of the mind that when you die, the Po dies with your body. And then this last part over here, the yi, the yellow, uh, the mustard colored one, is to do more with focus, short term memory, cognition, and what I would call like sharpness, the sharpness of your mind has a lot to do with this part of the, this part of the mind. So your ability to stay focused on one point for extended periods. And I think that's, you know, meditation as an example. When you sit in meditation, you're just observing one point. That's the part of the mind that you're developing is the yi, the focus. Yeah. And so just to give you an idea of when the shen, so this is a picture of when we're asleep, the shen actually lives in the heart. So when you're sleeping, the shen is in the heart and it's like nourishing itself, it's building itself. And when we wake up in the morning, the shen moves out of your heart and up into your eyes and out of your head and it's extending. It's, the energy is extending outwards down your arms into your palms. And then again, when you go to sleep, it goes back in and goes back down inside your heart and rests. So this is important to know because of like insomnia and when you're in mania, when you don't sleep, you're never, the Shen isn't returning to the heart and going to nourish in the chest. The Shen is continuously up in the eyes shooting out and it never really regenerates. And just lastly, the hun. So the hun, which is in the, you know, the, the, the inspirational part of your mind, this is the Chinese character. And it actually means cloud soul, cloud spirit. And in this symbolism on the, on the right side, this is actually a picture of a, of a ghost, what they would classify as a ghost. So this is the head of a person. And this is the body like fly, uh, like a, a loose garment of energy, fl you know, flopping behind it. So what I want to focus on here, or just emphasize is that the Hun likes movement. The Hun is energetic in nature and it's constantly moving and floating around the place. So in order for the hun to be happy, you need movement. It needs to be flowing. And this will make sense as we go into the next set. set. So any questions so far on all this? The five types of mind, the shan, the hun. Okay, so 
a good way to describe the functioning of these different five parts of mind. So we've got the Shen, which I said is the conscious mind, right? It's, you're, you're aware of it. You're, you've got a certain screen. And then all the other parts of the mind is actually sending impulses into the Shen. So we could call this the subconscious mind. The Hun, the Yi, the Ji, and the Po are all different parts of the mind sending impulses up into the Shen to be experienced, to be heard, to be felt. In the Chinese textbooks, they say that a lot of these lower parts of the mind or the subconscious parts of the mind, they don't feel, they don't have an emotion to them. They just have impulses. And it's the Shen which actually feels them. So inspiration shoots up into your conscious mind from the Hun. Now, if this is true, <laughs> the the work of the Shen and the trouble with the Shen and the Shen has a big job of managing all the impulses coming in. It's got to manage the inspirational creative energy. It's got to manage the motivational energy. It's got to manage the body's uh, impulses and it's got to manage the cognition and the focus and the short-term memory. So it's all shooting into the Shen. The Shen has a big job. And this is where it starts to go a bit skew when we're talking about mental health. It's to do with the Shen and can it handle it? So another way to look at it, if we were to look at the brain, the neurophysiology of the brain, one simplified way of looking at it is that the Shen is the frontal cortex. The executive functioning, they call it. So the Shen is receiving impulses from the other parts of the mind. It's receiving impulses from the body, emotions, the reptilian brain, you know, all these different functions, motivation, and it sends it to the frontal cortex to be processed. Right? So that's another way of looking at it, is that the Shen is the executive, the CEO, that's what it is. The Shen is the CEO, right? And then it's getting all these advisors shooting all this information at the Shen. Now, as if you've done any sort of studies in this field, is that one of the things that turns off when you're in a stress response is the frontal cortex. Right? When the amygdala fires up and you're in a you know, fear impulse, the Shen or the frontal cortex turns off because you don't really need it. You don't need to be processing music and emotions and language when you're being shot at. So the Shen goes offline and you go back to just basic impulse. But we have to, again, knock off the stress response, get the Shen back online so that we can function again and like do processing of emotions and all this stuff. If you're more of a yogi, so these are just different ways of looking at it. If you're more of a yogi, these impulses could be shooting up from the lower chakras into the third eye, which could be the Shen. The wisdom, the insight, the processing, it's kind of the third eye area. And the impulses, the sexuality, the creativity is shooting up from the lower areas. Okay, so now we have this, okay, what about bipolar, right? So this is where we get into this. What's happening with bipolar? So what seems to be happening and what the book, the textbooks are all saying is that in bipolar, the hun, which is the creative energy, is shooting and overwhelming the shen. You know, so you get an idea, you get inspired, and you're just so inspired, you can't sleep, right? You can't sleep, you're just so inspired, you're spending your money, you, you're onto something, right? So you're overwhelmed, you're so creative, you're so inspired. The Shen is unable to control the Hun. The Shen is unable to manage the Hun. They call it restrain the Hun. 
so the the the, the, shen, uh, the hornet is blasting the shen and the shen can't deal with it so then you get hyper inspired and then you go into mania but again if you're eccentric if you're just a little you know if you're less than mania you get this feeling often and, and i get this all the time i'm sure everyone uh, i'm sure you get this too is you have moments when you get super inspired right and it just takes over right? enough you get that narrow vision and you may be in that state for many hours maybe a few days and and i think that's okay like every now and then it's okay to become like the mad genius or the mad scientist probably a better one become a mad scientist and you just work on a project for a couple of days or whatever it may be, stay up late, you know, punching it out. And that's fine. Every now and then that's fine. That's part of the creative process, but it's when it happens and you know, messes with other parts of your life and destroys relationships and all that. That's when it becomes a problem. Right? So some part of the hun blasting you is okay. So then the question is, why doesn't the Shen, why can't the Shen restrain the Hun? Why doesn't the Shen have the power to do that? And this is where we look at what is the underlying problem here. And in Chinese med, they say there's a deficiency of yin and deficiency of blood. So blood is really the main fluid to do with the heart. And the heart is where the Shen typically lives. So there's not enough blood in your body, in your heart, to ground the Shen, or ground the Hun, sorry. So there's not enough blood in your system to ground the Hun. And when there's not enough grounding of the Hun, that's when the Hun takes over and you get flighty and you're ungrounded, essentially. So this is the key. There's, it seems to be that there's not enough blood. There's a blood deficiency in the body. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. How to, how to you know, treat it. What does that look like when there's a blood deficiency? How do you know if you've got blood deficiency? Right? We'll talk about that soon. The other thing which knocks out your blood is like um, shock. You know, so if you get shock or trauma, you go pale, the blood withdraws, and usually there's like a blood deficiency that, that kicks in. And, and after shock, if you can process it and move on, then your body, if you're healthy and, and such, your body regenerates and you get the blood going again. But in some people, if you're already deficient in blood and then you get a shock, now you're creating more blood deficiency and you're causing more potential for psychiatric kind of potentially psychiatric imbalances. Does that make sense? Anyone got any questions about that bit? You can unmute yourself or send me a chat. Cool. I'll take no questions as a good sign because that means it's clear. <laughs> And at the end, we'll also have questions as well. Okay. So, okay, well, that's the mania aspect. So mania looks like it's just the hun overrunning the shen, the inspirational energy overrunning the shen. So that's the mania aspect. What about the depression aspect? And this also, not just in the bipolar, this we're talking about depression, but we're talking about depression across the board. Why or what is the dynamic here between the Hun and the Shan, which creates depression? And this is that the Hun has no movement. There's no creative energy coming out of the Hun and into the Shan, right? There's no inspiration. There's no dreams. There's no energy. There's no motivation. What's the point? So there's not enough hun now. 
and there's no creative energy. And that's what we, that's what we could term as depression. Quote, question. Yes, so I got a question. Uh, how do you know if you have a blood deficiency? We'll talk about that in a moment. And yeah, that's what happens in flight or flight. What happens in the fight or flight state is, yeah, the frontal cortex, which is off. So that the Shen is off, basically. But you've got to get the Shen back online to be able to process life. Yeah. So depression, there's no creative energy. There's no inspiration. So no energy. Yeah. Very easy to understand once you understand the function of the horn. And then the next level. So then there's one more pattern. And this is part of a, uh, this is part of a depression dynamic, but also this is more like going into psychosis. And what is happening here when we go into psychosis is that the Hun is sending energy to the Shen, but there's an obstruction the energy can't somehow get through to the Shen. It's like, I was trying to think of a metaphor. It's like you got a car and you push it up against a wall, a solid wall, and then you start the car and you're pushing, you're trying to drive through the wall. But it's just, it's up against it and there's the, the tires are spinning and there's, there's smoke coming out everywhere. And we've got all this uh, energy and all this heat which builds up and then it shoots out through the system and creates delusion, psychosis, hallucination, paranoia, all these things. So there's plenty of energy, but it's just not getting through. And in Chinese medicine books, they describe it as, they call it phlegm misting the heart. Phlegm misting the heart and brain. So what is that? What is phlegm? So it can be translated as, yeah, like thick, gunky, um, stuck fluid. So it could be connective tissue is all, is all tight and it's like it's all become obstructed. So no energy can move through the connective tissue anymore. It can also be like heavy metals or calcification inside and around the brain or around the heart. So the, the heart feels trapped, the brain feels trapped, the cerebral spinal fluid's kind of stuck. Right? So it's that kind of nature. This is the description that they have come up with is that it's something is stuck around the heart and around the brain or around the cerebral spinal fluid where it's not able to move calcification, phlegm, all sorts of nasty things, right? Phlegm is really, when phlegm stays in your body and doesn't move, it's it just, it, it can become like a tumorous uh, substance or tumorous cells that just sit there, stagnant. Uh, maybe not deadly, but the phlegm just sits in your body because it's stagnant. And if that gets in the wrong place, messes with physiology quite significantly. No problem, Jade. So when the Shen is obstructed, you can get panic attacks as well. So if you think about the Shen as in the heart, the heart with people with panic attacks is that they often feel a pressure on their chest, in their chest. They can't breathe properly. So that's an obstruction, right? Connective tissue is tightening around the, the heart, the pericardium's tight, the lungs are tight. There's some kind of obstruction. So the good news is, is that it's actually, you can treat it, right? You've got to just clear out the obstructions in the system. Though I will say that there are some people that uh, it's an extreme condition and they may be predisposed to it. Like it might be uh, 
in their you know genetic makeup and things like this whereas you can treat them but there are some people that will be really serious and it'll be it'll be very hard to treat whereas other people will be easier to treat so it's not absolute that's what i'm trying to get to is like you can't apply the same thing and everyone's going to get the same result you will likely get a good result on some people and maybe not a good result on others <clears throat> And schizophrenia is probably the most uh, uh, strongest representation of what they would call obstruction. Shen is obstructed. Yeah. And again, it can be very difficult to treat. Uh, but if you apply some of these principles, you could get some headway or at least start diminishing or reducing uh, dependency and reducing symptoms. Because a lot of these as well, <clears throat> a lot of like uh, bipolar, schizophrenia don't seem to come on, don't seem to be affect the person until, uh, I know bipolar is like in the 20, when you're about 20 to 29 or 18 to 29, that's the most diagnosed uh, group of people. And I think schizophrenia is in that realm as well. It's kind of in this age group when you've gone through childhood and then you're, you're reaching young adulthood. <clears throat> And then these, it gets stronger. So did something happen to this person in childhood that created an obstruction, like trauma? And then as they reach 20 years old, it becomes strong and serious, and then it starts affecting them in that way. So it's very likely, very likely that that's how it built up, right? <clears throat> So it basically comes down to three patterns of bipolar. Well, there's three patterns involved, excuse me. <clears throat> the three patterns are the hun is moving, but the shen can't manage it. And that's the mania aspect. Creative energy flowing through, but you can't manage it. And then depression has two patterns, potentially is there's no movement of the hun, and the third one is the hun is moving, but the shen is obstructed. And that's more like psychosis, gets serious. Yeah. Cool. So what I'm going to do, and this is where I'm going to have a little break, and uh, we can also have questions. But if that's the case, right, if these three patterns is what's the case in bipolar, what is the treatment principle, they call it? Uh, how do we approach that? How do we correct it? So the first one is in mania, you've got to build the shen, build the blood so that it can manage the horn. And in depression, we've got to move the horn. If the horn is not moving, we're going to move it. Right? And the last one is we've got to clear the obstruction. Right? Clear the obstruction. So these are the three treatment principles, and that's what we're going to go into next. Like, how do you do these things? But first, let's have a little, a little break or questions as well, and I'll open it up before I get into it.